Everybody, I'm with Mrs. Uh, Senowitz, Tracy Senowitz of Uni United Cere Cerebral Palsy, and we're talking about Alabama Lifespan Respite. Um, and I would like to ask for anybody that's not familiar with mm -hmm. respite care, what exactly is respite care? Respite is just a break for the caregiver, and it's you know an opportunity for the caregiver to take care of themselves to help reduce uh, stress and burnout and possible neglect and abuse. And that can be anything from, you know, going to the hairdresser, going to your doctor appointments, going to visit with friends, going to church, anything you can do to rest and relax and and um, be the best caregiver you can be for your loved one. And it makes sense that you do need some breaks there. And when you say caregiver, you're talking more about the family caregiver there. Yes, we're talking about the unpaid family caregiver. So it might be um, a wife caring for their husband who has dementia or um, a dad caring for the daughter who has um, an intellectual disability. Mm -hmm. It could be someone who's had a stroke, any chronic illness or disability, uh, any age. So uh, it's just that, that family member who's providing round-the-clock care for their loved one. Is it possible for the family member to be compensated financially for that caregiving? Not through this program. What we do is, is called reimbursement. Our program's a reimbursement program. So what we do is it's we allow the caregiver to choose someone to come in the home, a care provider to come in the home and give them that break. So it's a personal choice option. So you can choose it, anyone over the age of 18 who lives outside of your home. Mm -hmm. It can be another family member. It can be a friend, a neighbor, somebody from church, anyone you trust to stay with your loved one while you take that needed break. Yeah. I feel like that's a big thing because uh, a lot of caregivers come from uh, providers and uh, a lot of families feel like they want to hire their caregivers one-on-one. Um, mm -hmm. -on -one. mm -hmm. And if you know somebody that would be really good mm -hmm. uh, as a family member or a friend, something like that, that makes sense on both levels. Yeah, it does. And a lot of times, you know, you can use an agency. Um, your dollars are going to, your reimbursement dollars are going to stretch further uh, with uh, the unskilled care, again, with that person that you know and trust. Mm. And just having that comfort level of somebody who already knows your loved one and may already know their routines or, you know, um, they're, you know, even things that um, just they're friends with them. Somebody they know, they know, the caregiver knows and the care recipient knows. Yeah, maybe it somebody, a lot. somebody from church or, mm -hmm. you know, a good, good member there. Now, you said that the dollars will stretch a little further. Mm -hmm. What's the difference there? So, let's say that, you know, you do have a neighbor who will come and stay. You might be able to negotiate a rate to pay with them for ten dollars an hour, whereas if you called a service, called a you know a provider agency, they may say, well, we can only you know do it for the least amount of hours as four hours, and we charge twenty dollars an hour. Mm -hmm. So you're not going to be able to negotiate that rate of pay with them. They have set number of hours and a set pay rate. So. Um, when we issue a voucher for reimbursement, which is basically like a timesheet, it's going to have an award amount at the top of it. And so that's the amount of dollars we'll be able to reimburse you for in a time period. And so if you have $200 and you're paying your neighbor $10 an hour, it's $20 or 20 hours worth of respite. Mm -hmm. But if you're paying an, a provider through an agency, it's $20 an hour, then you're only going to get 10 hours of respite. Yeah, that makes sense. Uh, now, how long are those time periods usually? Do you usually, uh, is respite reimbursed at quarterly or monthly or yearly? Um, well, like right now, our current um, voucher that, that we've just issued, we just, we're on fiscal year, so our new fiscal year just started. So it's September 1 through the end of December is the, the time frame right now for our voucher. And then when uh, the individuals who are on our universal program submit that to us, then they'll get their reimbursement check and the next voucher. How long does that reimbursement check usually take? Does that come in the month or? We try to process, you know, just as, as quickly as we can. We tell everyone that the anticipated wait time is 60 to 90 days. It's not always. Yeah. Uh, but we like to say that to be safe. Yeah. You don't want to wait for that check or your neighbor to be like, hey, you know, I'm going on vacation next week. Yeah. You know, I was taking care of your son or your daughter. Well, the way ours works, it's reimbursement. So you as the caregiver would go ahead and pay your neighbor mm. and then we reimburse you. Okay. For having taken that. That's a good way to do it. Mm -hmm. So how does um, Alabama, right, uh, Alabama Lifespan Respite fit in with UCP of Huntsville? So we are a program, a statewide program of UCP Huntsville, and we have other statewide programs here. Uh, but it did start here at UCP Huntsville in the year 2000 through um, a Children's Trust Fund grant. And um, that program is called HEARTS, and it's still in existence. But it is for 
care recipients who are age, is it 18 or 19? 18 and under. And um, so it's, it's primarily, you know, it is completely focused towards children. Um, that was the first grant that we received and were able to start our respite program. And from that, we've continued to build and have uh, find other funding sources and expand the respite um, options that we have for caregivers. So now what we have is a universal program. Mm -hmm. So it's for any age and any chronic illness or disability. Yeah, so you guys started with the children's there, mm -hmm. children respite, and, and through those results grew to all ages. Yeah. Now what are some of the funding sources there? You said you started with a grant, and how did that mm -hmm. grow? So um, we have had funding through the years from uh, from ACDD, the Council on Developmental Disabilities. Shout out to ACDD. Right, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> um, currently, we are uh, funded by the Alabama Department of Senior Services and the Alabama Department of Rehabilitation Services. So ADSS and ADRS are our primary. Uh, they are our two primary funding sources yeah. currently. Yeah. And then we also have some uh, some funding for direct voucher for from the Department of Mental Health. Okay, got you there. Yeah. Um, as kind of a, an ID or service there, it would be under. Correct. Yeah. And we have adult and child for them. Who is eligible? So <clears throat> any unpaid family caregiver in Alabama who, ha who cares for a care recipient with a chronic illness or disability that requires care and is not on another program receiving respite. So that would be a Medicaid waiver or through the Alabama CARES program through like the um, area agencies on aging. So um, uh, are there other, uh, VA, VA is another source. So if they are um, re currently receiving uh, through Alabama Head Injury Foundation, ALS, Autism Society, through our HEARTS program, um, they wouldn't be eligible. So we're kind of a gap program. Yeah. So if you're not being served by any other agency for respite services, then you'd be eligible for hours. Now, do you currently have to be receiving some type of service, even though it's not respite, to be eligible? Nope. You just have to have a diagnosis. We do ask for a proof of diagnosis with the application. Mm -hmm. And so that would just be a simple statement from your doctor, from a social worker, um, that says that your care recipient does have a diagnosis that requires care. Um, is there a, so you have to have the documentation, is there more of an importance put on people that are receiving services already versus those that are not? Um, so like I said, we are that gap if they're, so no, <laughs> no, uh, there's not, it's kind of first come first serve with our application process. So if you're in that gap, you're not receiving any respite services as the caregiver. So our program is primarily for the caregiver more than the care recipient. Yeah. So it doesn't really matter if they're receiving, you know, any medical services or not as the care recipient because our program focuses on the caregiver. Okay. And then where, uh, what type of locations can respite care uh, take place in? Uh, really anywhere. Primarily we see it in the home. But if your community has a day program and you want to use that as your respite opportunity, yeah. that's fine. If there's a camp, you know, specifically for, um, you know, like through Alabama Head Injury or, um, you know, maybe through BUDS or Autism Society, then um, then you can absolutely use your respite funds for those opportunities as well. Yeah, normally when I think of respite, I think of somebody coming into the house um, uh, and watching or, you know, taking mm -hmm. care of. But that's a really good point that if there is a camp going on that week mm -hmm. um, that you won't be able to make because you have to do something, but you know your son or your daughter would really enjoy, yeah. then that respite care uh, reimbursement can go to that camp. Yeah. But you would pay out of the pocket for the camp and then you would be reimbursed for it. Correct. Yeah. And yeah. the same thing for an adult day program or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of times people think, you know, well, if you're caregiving that your individual's homebound, that's not always the case. Um, and they may get a lot of, they may get their own respite from a day, you know, a day program or a camp being around their peers. Uh, you know, just being somewhere different, being out of the house, having that opportunity to be in the community. Yeah, I mean, I love my family, but there are times that I'm like, I gotta get away from <laughs> yeah, you guys. Exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's like, don't talk yeah. to me. I'm walking down the street. <laughs> we all get cabin fever. Yeah. You know, so, yeah. Um, how would you find a care provider? So that's a that's a challenge a lot of times, especially in rural areas. Um, you know, we are a statewide program, so we get calls every day from individuals saying, you know, thank you for, you know, enro you know, getting us enrolled in the program, but now how can I find someone to come in and give me that respite? Yeah. Um, 
and sometimes people don't have those natural supports. They may be new to the area and haven't made you know friends with their neighbors yet or established a church community, um, or may not have relatives who are able to help them. Um, so then what do you do? Well, we have a statewide database uh, at alabamarespite.org, and you can go click on there by county and see what options are available in your community. And those are gonna be um, at churches. Most of them are at churches or community-based centers. It's not uh, gonna be individuals. So if you consider yourself a care provider, we're not gonna have you listed on there. Um, so it, it, for liability reasons. Yeah, no, it would be like <laughs> um, a, a day sitter, or, you know, a yeah. daycare kind of thing. Yeah, so you're gonna see your day programs, maybe some of the camps, um, some of the community resources there. If um, you are looking for an individual and not an agency, it's really hard because there is a care provider shortage, not only in the state of Alabama, but everywhere. And that's a growing problem as baby boomers continue to age. Mm -hmm. And um, so, you know, a lot of times we're gonna refer you to those community resources. Uh, some people go to care.com. Care mm -hmm. Yeah. And because uh, people think of that, you know, a lot of times just as babysitters for children, there are also care providers for adults on there. Yeah, so. I imagine it could be something for like a college student if they were looking to make mm -hmm. a couple extra bucks and they were going into, you know, healthcare or what have you. Uh, that would be a great uh, link up there between the two entities. Yes, it absolutely would be. And, um, you know, that's one of the, the problems uh, we're trying to address is the care provider shortage. And we the talk always comes back to our universities and mm. our junior colleges and, um, you know, those students who are entering health care and maybe need some practical experience. It keeps circling back to that conversation that yeah. seems like a natural fit. It's like they should put the university right next to the uh, the care center. Yeah. <laughs> you know, dorm up together. But that's been a conversation mm -hmm. I've had with uh, other families is, um, are there going to be communities where that, that's a thing? Mm -hmm. In other cultures, you see like families live together, yeah. uh, three generations. In the U.S., too, I don't think we have that as much, mm -hmm. um, but kind of fundamentally setting that up uh, where they would share dorm rooms or mm -hmm. something like that, I think would be a cool thing. I would too. Yeah. So you're seeing this nationwide. Yes. A shortage of caregivers and it. Yes, we really are, and um, we have, and I'm sure we'll talk about it maybe a little bit later, but we have um, a governor-appointed coalition, and that's one of the things that our coalition is has really been tasked with looking at, is how do we address this shortage? Um, what do we do? And um, like I said, it, it's not just us. We um, follow respite news nationwide, well, even internationally. And uh, everyone's trying to come up with a solution to this problem. What yeah. are we going to do when we get that tsunami of baby boomers aging to the point where they do need full-time care? I w oh, do you think it has anything to do with, well, I can go uh, and work another job and make more money? Absolutely. Um, you know, like I said, if you're negotiating a rate for an individual at $10 an hour, um, there's a lot of places you can go and do a lot less work and make more money. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, it's... You know, everybody says, oh, well, you have to have the heart for caregiving. True, but you also have to have a living wage. Mm -hmm. And uh, so it's, um, you know, it's hard to attract people to the field if the money's not there to support them having a living wage to be able to do it. I totally agree with you. Mm -hmm. um, you talked about there may be a difference in uh, provider caregiving where they charge $20 an hour, but you can negotiate. Is it a set reimbursement rate? Um, that we provide yeah it is and it you know it's primarily we get a set amount of funding and so the number of applicants we have we basically divide it out and so um, that's you know based on how many people we have enrolled at the time that'll determine the amount of voucher reimbursement we're able to offer you per voucher mm -hmm. that makes sense yeah. now how would someone go about applying for a respite so we have a brand new application. Our application's nice and nice and simple. I wanted to show it to you. And uh, it just asks some basic information about the caregiver. And then some basic information over here about the care recipient, the person that they're caring for. And then it asks those qualifying questions we talked about earlier. You know, are you on any other program? And then we ask for the proof of diagnosis. So it's really, we try to make it as simple as possible. Uh, we can email this to you. It's fillable, so you don't have to print it out or anything. You can do it online, save it, and just send it right back to us. 
Um, and right now we're in the midst of getting our website updated. So it's not on, uh, on the website right now, but all you have to do is uh, call or email us and we'll shoot it right over to you. Excuse me, now how long does that process usually take from the time someone fills out the form to the time they hear back or say, yes, we're gonna reimburse you? A couple of weeks at most. Um, we try to have pretty quick turnaround on that. Like I said, we are at the beginning of our new fiscal year, so we've kind of had an influx of them right now. Mm -hmm. uh, but our new fiscal year started September 1, and we've already gotten started getting vouchers out um, to those who have enrolled. So, you know, we're, we're two and a half weeks in now, so yeah. Do you notice that a lot of people that receive uh, reimbursement uh, do do so again in the following uh, year? Yes. Uh, we send out a survey and just basically ask them, has your caring situation changed as any, in any way? <clears throat> Is your care recipient still with you? Um, have you qualified for another program? Because a lot of times uh, the individuals, like I said, we're at the GAP program. They may be on a waiting list for another program like through Alabama Cares or Medicaid Waiver. So if then their, their situation has changed and they're on that, then we can give their slot to another family. Yeah. So. It's a gap that uh, really needed to be filled there. Yeah. So um, once they fill out that survey and let us know if anything's changed or not, then we re-enroll them for the program um, and then take new applications as well. But yes, we do see a lot of families who've been with us, our family caregivers who've been with us for quite a while. Now, uh, I imagine that a lot of times when somebody hears about respite, it's kind of in an emergency situation mm -hmm. where it's like, I don't know what to do. And somebody says, you need to go check out respite. I'm like, what the heck is respite? Yeah. Uh, so talk maybe about some of those emergency situations and how uh, how quickly that can be taken care of. Okay. We do have a separate funding and application process for that emergency respite. So what that might look like is if, you know, you as the caregiver had your own emergency come up, like you've got to have surgery um, you are in the hospital, you've been hospitalized for some reason, you've had a death and need to attend a funeral out of state and you need someone to stay with your, your loved one, maybe over the course of a couple of days while you attend to your own emergency, then we have an application process that we can turn around pretty quickly mm -hmm. to let you know, um, yes, we can reimburse you for this amount while you attend to your emergency as the caregiver. What happens if that individual cannot go out of pocket first? Has mm -hmm. that ever happened? I'm sure it probably has. <laughs> um, you know, I think that's the beauty in getting, you know, to have that personal choice option to see if, uh, you know, so if it is your neighbor or your family member or your church member, they're probably going to be more understanding than, say, an agency. Yeah. The agency may have to have that up front or they may, you know, I, you know, it may be a different situation with an agency. But if you have that, you know, relationship with your individual care provider they may be able to say we got you yeah don't we worry understand. about this we'll figure it out later yeah uh is everything okay yeah, yeah. okay <laughs> uh -oh. so we're we're doing audio now yeah perfect okay <laughs> um let's talk a little bit about uh respite clinics okay so um respite clinics are um it's kind of like Medicaid open enrollment. So uh, our program manager, Brittany Huey, goes around the state and uh, we'll partner with our, <laughs> Brittany's off, just off camera Let's here. tilt the camera, you're lucky the camera's <laughs> off. <laughs> uh, but she goes around the state. We partner with our uh, friends through the Alabama um, CARES program, through the AAAs and through CRS and some of our state agencies where they already have kind of a built-in audience. Mm -hmm. And so their families who they know aren't currently being served by one of the programs we talked about earlier for respite services would be eligible to apply. And so what we do is on site, explain the program to them, explain the application process, do the applications on site. They are already connected to this agency so we can get that third party verification for the proof of diagnosis on site. Yeah. And then we can show them exactly how their voucher is gonna work and you know, talk them through the process and do all that on site in one day. So yeah. uh, we've already had one uh, this quarter and we've got several more here. We got <clears throat> one coming up in Tuscaloosa on September 24th. We have one in Mobile on October 4th and one in Robertsville, which is in Baldwin County, I'll say, in October 10th. Mm. So we've got those coming up. And um, like I said, it's just a great way to get all the information to see if it's something you're interested in, see if you qualify, and just do it all on site, on site and then you don't have to call or email 
we can just kind of come to you in your natural environment. Yeah, that's a perfect day if you're interested in it. You, yeah. you come in at what, 8 o'clock or 10.30? Yeah, and... let's say the one September 24th in Tuscaloosa is 10.30 to 12. And it's a powerful hour and a half. Yes, it, it absolutely is. And it's going to be at uh, the Crimson Village in Tuscaloosa. And then in Mobile, October 4th is 9 to 11. And it's going to be at, um, is that, that's SARPC's building, correct? Mm -hmm. So um, that's our Alabama Cares uh, partner there. And then the one in Robertsdale is uh, also with a SARPC at the Baldwin County Commission, and it's 9 to 11 on October. Now, mostly uh, the attendees there will be family members? Yes, these will be the, the family caregiver mm -hmm. um, because, <clears throat> well, the family caregivers, especially of our CRS, you know, they're there bringing their care recipient in for services. Yeah. So that's kind of, you know, a nice fit because they're already there um, through our Alabama Cares partners. Um, a lot of times uh, it may be that they have been served by the Alabama Cares program and have rolled off. Okay. And so uh, those Alabama Cares uh, coordinators are trying to make this um, resource readily available to them because they don't want them to go without services. Yeah, for sure. Kind of a stepping stone, like you mm -hmm. <coughs> said there, filling the gap. Yeah. Now, how many uh, caregivers receive respite uh, yearly? So cu currently, at least we're kind of in a weird spot with fiscal year right now, but uh, for our fiscal year that just ended, we had about 600 um, total families for the received, state for the state who received respite through us um, something that uh, some people may or may not know about us too is I keep talking about our partners with AAA with Alabama Cares um, eight of the 13 offices we manage their respite voucher programs for them mm. so uh, you may be receiving uh, respite through your Alabama Cares program but the check actually comes from us <laughs> Gotcha. So, and the voucher comes from us. So we manage those as well. So that is even more, but just through, you know, what we do. Um, so you guys are the go-to respite. Like, you know, the financial. We it, try to be. Yeah. <laughs> That's the goal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, we say we want people to be able to call us, you know, visit it with us, uh, access us online. But to be able to access resources, attend our caregiver education events, and to apply for respite. Yeah. And those are our primary focuses. Uh, I think it's such a necessary thing that the caregiver does need a break sometimes. Or you mm -hmm. said there's a, there's emergencies where you have to go out of state or you're in yeah. the hospital and uh, you just don't know what's going to happen. And you can ask friends and family, but it's nice to say, hey, I can actually reimburse you for, for doing this. Yes. Um, you know, yeah. it's not going to be long term maybe, but mm -hmm. uh, in, in cases where you need it. Yeah. <clears throat> Let's talk a little bit about the community-based respite expansion grants and how to apply. Okay, sure. So um, uh, we've let's see four. We've had four so far, and we've got. Well, uh, there will be two more we award this year. So it's a very simple application process. And what this for, is for is those community-based programs we talked about earlier. So your day programs, your drop-ins, um, to be able to expand the respite services they're already providing. Or maybe if you are ready to start one, your church, your school, you know, whatever organization in the community, you're ready to start a respite program, uh, this would be some seed money to do that. Okay. And we also provide technical assistance, so we don't just give you the money and walk away. You know, we come in and say, what can we do to help you get started or to help you expand? Um, one really good example of a startup is uh, we have a partnership with the University of North Alabama in Florence. And um, they have they started a new program. Um, it was last year called Lion Buddies, and so they were specifically providing respite to young adults um, with disabilities. And was their primary focus uh, intellectual disabilities, or was it any disability? Yeah. Any disability. Um, and it was great because they were focusing on these young adults, but the uh, students were really the ones running the program. So, I mean, they had, you know, this great peer experience where the students were including the, the young adults with disabilities into their daily life and campus activities. So, yeah. for homecoming and for uh, special events on campus and games and things like, you know, sports games and things like that, um, they've had the best time. So it's not like they're just dropping them off to be babysat. It's not that. The parents know 
that their young adult is being included in a campus community and having a great experience. Yeah, and the individual probably loves it. I yes. was at a uh, meeting at um, Samford University last week, and there are a group of students there that are doing some great advocacy uh, on campus. Oh. And I wonder if they'd be interested in yeah. doing some type of respite. Because uh, awesome. that would be really cool. Yeah. And it makes sense, like you said, using the college and, and the mm-hmm. students that are uh, hungry and going into that profession and, mm-hmm. and giving back. And I'm sure the individuals love being on campus. Yeah. Like doing stuff that, you know, everybody does at that age. Yeah, absolutely. And we, I mean, some of the best pictures have come out of that. I love seeing all the pictures when they're doing activities. And um, they, uh, Brittany's been and, and helped with a couple of things too. And so she's had a good experience with that. But yeah, that's just, you know, that's what we want to do. We want to encourage um, communities to kind of think out of the box and come up with new experiences to include individuals with, with disabilities. Now you said there are uh, some new grants and some seed money that way, but what does that look like? Uh, let, let's say that organization at Sanford, do they have to go through a certification or? No, they just, uh, we have a real simple application process and that'll uh, go live in, in, in near the end of October with us. Um, so uh, we'll send out a big constant contact to all our partners throughout the state and let them know that uh, it's available. Uh, we'll post on our website and through our social media as well. Um, it does require um, letters of support, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, then just some basic information about the, the agency or the organization itself. Yeah, I imagine that universities would be really a uh, hotbed there for mm-hmm. Uh, doing that and I'm going to say something to them yeah I think it would be a good yeah. idea oh, yeah please do so we'll have two grants that will be awarded uh, before the end of this year so they can you know have it ready and get started for 2020 yeah um, how about the coalition activities I know you kind of mm-hmm. mentioned the coalition a little earlier here uh, coalition activities to expand respite for caregivers yes so again we have a governor appointed uh, Alabama lifespan respite coalition and um, we are one of, um, I, I can't remember, a handful of lifespan grantees um, in the U.S. And so those federal funds are uh, come through ADSS, like I mentioned before. And um, as part of that, um, this coalition was formed to bring together agencies and individuals who can further um, respite opportunities for caregivers in Alabama. So currently our coalition, um, the, the governor appoints certain um, agencies. So we have um, the Alabama Department of Mental Health. We have um, uh, Medicaid. What? Medicaid. Medicaid, that's right, Medicaid, DHR, uh, the Governor's Office on Disabilities, um, just a range of different folks and partners to, who come together. We meet uh, in person at least twice a year in Montgomery. And then uh, we have subcommittees for different issues who um, meet on their own more often. And again, we're just trying to expand respite opportunities and resources uh, for all Alabama caregivers. Right now, we're trying to, the subcommittees are trying to add to that uh, statewide data, uh, provider database that I mentioned before Mm -hmm. to um, update any information that's already on there or add anyone who's missing so that's their big push right now we want to make those uh, resources available to everyone um, and we don't want to miss anybody so they're making a really big push right now to get all those providers on there that that we know of Uh, and then our other committee is our public awareness committee and so i'd mentioned we do caregiver education and um, they're trying to expand upon those opportunities too. Who can we partner with to bring uh, new caregiver information to caregivers around the state? Uh, what are we missing? Uh, what can they do? What can they present on that would be of value to caregivers? Um, so those are our, our big initiatives for this year. Do you think there'll ever be that uh, online a forum for the individuals uh, like the providers have you can go and find a provider do you think they'll ever be that we would love for that to happen someday that would be a lot of work though it would be a lot of work and that's always the question you know who uh host it who um assumes the liability for it yeah the liability would be a big thing it would be and uh, and um you know there would have to be standards in place uh, for the care providers and who um, who comes up with the standards and uh, and provides the training. 
Uh, I'd like to talk a little bit about the liability there. So if, um, let's say, a group of students at a college are going to apply for a grant and try and be a respite uh, provider there, mm -hmm. are they liable um, if something happens? Well, that would be the university yeah. that would have to apply. Yeah. So then, I mean, depending on, they would have to tell us what program or what they're wanting to do with the respite funding. So it just depends on what they're wanting to do. But um, like University of North Alabama, when they drop their kiddos off for the respite night, mm -hmm. um, they have a waiver that they sign because it's volunteer people. Mm -hmm. They're wanting to do good for the community. So and there's... And a lot of churches, yeah, and a lot of churches have nights just for children with special needs, and they have that same kind of waiver process. Um, the when you come into the liability, it's really for someone who's providing skilled care to an individual. So that's where you get into the liability. It's more than just sitting with them and making sure everything's okay. Yeah. I mean, if they have a feeding tube or a trach or, you know, they um, need medication administered, then that's where you get into a liability issue. Yeah, that makes sense there. Yeah. It needs a little bit more attention. Um, <clears throat> so you talked a little bit about the caregiving resources. Mm -hmm. Is there anything you'd like to add to that? Yeah, so um, we like to think when people call here and they have a question or a concern about caregiving or being a caregiver, if we don't have, uh, if we can't provide the answer, we want to be able to tell you where, where you can get the answer. If it's not us, then who? And um, so um, Brittany is a social worker and she has a vast knowledge of resources throughout the state. Uh, we try to stay very uh, in touch with our collaborative partners to know what they offer. And again, that's part of that coalition too. They offer resources to us so we can share those uh, with our caregivers. Um, a big resource that we offer is that, that caregiver education. So we go out into the community statewide and we offer workshops and trainings. It can be on caregiver wellness, on grief, on... Um, stress and burnout um, I think we've got about 30 different topics that we train on and um, the caregivers it kind of gives them a respite opportunity to come to that mm -hmm. but they're gonna pick up so many more resources when they're there things are like oh my gosh I never heard of that I never thought of that why haven't I thought of that you know um, it's kind of an aha moment so we provide a lot of resources through our caregiver education piece as well um, and a lot of times when you see us advertise for our caregiver education uh, opportunities, it'll tell you on there, you know, if you apply or if you RSVP by a certain date, here's when you get a $100 respite voucher to the, to the first 10 people to RSVP. What? Free money? Yes. Yeah, so we, our hope is that you use that stipend to take a break. Yeah. So, um, you know, you'll see that when uh, when we advertise on uh, on social media. Y'all better be on this right now. Just yeah. like calling her out, take it. <laughs> That's take right. It. Um, so, you know, we, we want everybody to know that we want to make it as easy as possible for you to attend these caregiver education events, learn about us, learn about the resources in the community, and be compensated for your time. Mm -hmm. Now, would the gifts conference earlier this year, would that be considered an uh, educational uh, resource there? The one we did with Vonda? Mm -hmm. Yeah. With yeah, Mrs. Yeah. Reeves? Yeah. Uh, yes. And Vonda, um, she does some of our trainings for us. She's one of our education specialists down in South Alabama. And uh, yes, we absolutely, we do conferences, um, uh, caregiver appreciation events. Um, yeah. We, we kind of go wherever people ask us to come and, and share caregiver education we do yeah I imagine you guys are in pretty high demand and you have you know quite a lineup coming this year yeah. uh, you know later this year so now we talked about uh, education for the caregivers how about um, some learning for the businesses uh, mm -hmm. lunch and community organizations yeah we do lunch and learns and Brittany does this she does a great job at that but uh, <laughs> what we do we uh, you know go into businesses and um, let them know that this resource is available for their employees and and even explain a little bit of the, the stress that uh, an employed caregiver could be under. It's hard enough to be a caregiver, but if you're working a full-time job and you're the full-time caregiver as well, um, you know, we want to make businesses aware um, that that's how stressful that is and what they can do to support 
that caregiver. Mm. Um, so that's primarily what the, the Lunch and Learns do is kind of help the business community. What are some examples of businesses that uh, you've done that with in the past year? So we usually do our Lunch and Learns with social workers at the hospital. We'll do them with um, health agencies, anybody that is going to be in contact with those families. Yeah. Um, because whether or not they know it, there's probably a caregiver in the mix somewhere so they can relay that information. Um, in the in the Lunch and Learns, we do a lot of um, this is how you appropriately refer to our program. This is who qualifies. Um, but we do find a lot of the employers and employees that we're talking to, they are a caregiver as well. Mm. Um, so they're always happy to hear it and they always share it with, with their families that they're serving. Yeah, <clears throat> kind of going to the hot spots there <laughs> and getting some lunch. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> So we call it a lunch and learn because we do it typically during lunch time. Yeah. There's no food involved. Yeah. Alabama Respite is a nonprofit. <laughs> we cannot provide food with our funding. So we usually partner with somebody who can provide that food. <laughs> or they can bring a brown bag lunch. Yeah. <laughs> That's the way to do it. Yeah. Um, we're kind of getting uh, close to the end here, and I was, uh, are there any upcoming events that you'd like to highlight? Well, we touched about our respite clinics and um, some of our workshops and things, but we have some, some new things coming up we're pretty excited about. Um, we are going to start offering some of our caregiver education um, through virtual reality. Yes, I was just going to ask online, are you guys doing courses on there? Or? Well, it's not so online. It is the VR glasses. It's through a, a company called Embodied Labs. So it's really a caregiver empathy training. We do something um, um, similar to it, but in real life. <laughs> and uh, we do a caregiver simulation, and we usually do that with our university partners. Uh, and it is, is, like I said, it is empathy training, but this one's more on an individual basis. So you can experience what it is not to be the caregiver per se, but to be the care recipient. So you kind of get the flip of that. So when you try to talk through this VR experience, let's say you're an individual who is in, in stage Alzheimer's and you're trying to communicate to your caregiver what you need, what you want, what's wrong. In the simulation, it's not going to come out that way. What? So you, yeah. That's a crazy sim. Yes. And so your language is, is going to be completely uh, distorted. Your body movements are not going to match what you're doing through the VR because that's what it's like to be an individual in end-stage Alzheimer's. So you're, as the caregiver, you're going to get that experience. And so maybe you'll have more empathy for your care recipient to see, you know, how frustrated they are. You think you're frustrated as the caregiver, but to imagine how frustrated they are as the care recipient trying to communicate when they can't or trying to make their body do something they can't do anymore. Um, so we're really excited about offering that yeah. that as a caregiver education piece. Now, uh, can anyone access that? Well, we'll offer it just like we do through our trainings and workshops. We'll offer it that way. Um, so that'll be one of the things you can attend and do is so that'll have to be own. something on site that you do so if I had like a, a VR headset I couldn't do it through my mm -hmm. phone or anything and yeah. have to be on site yeah has to be on site because I would like to do that yeah I'll let you know it yeah up. you got in Birmingham when you guys come through Birmingham yeah I'll, I'll be there I want to check yeah. that out yeah maybe we'll do a, a little bit of our cameras work and we'll yeah. do a little bit of that. and it's really neat because too like say if you have on the glasses and you're the person going through the experience you can put it up on the big screen in a room so everybody else can see what it is you're experiencing. And, you know, they'll be able to hear what you're really trying to say and everything. So, it, you know, that's kind of a neat add-on to that, too, is everybody can kind of go through it with you and experience it. So we're excited about that. Yeah, that's something that I never thought about before, but I think would be great for the caregiver to better understand, mm -hmm. you know, the frustrations and needs of the individual, yeah. uh, especially when it comes to communication. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, so we're excited about that. We're also getting a new website. Hopefully by the end of the year, we'll roll that out. Uh, we're starting a newsletter, so we want everybody to be on the lookout for that so you'll know exactly where these trainings are and workshops and conferences, anything, you know, the clinics, anything we offer out in the community for caregivers to attend for free. And uh, we invite you to, if you haven't already, to uh, join us on social media. We are, um, Alabama Respite is on Facebook and Twitter. And um, something new we're trying to pilot for this year is called Daughterhood Circle, and it's a national program. And it's kind of a, a modern take on the caregiver support group. 
And so instead of sitting around in a church basement or a library or something and folding chairs in a circle and everybody just talking about what it's like to be a caregiver, these are more um, fun outings. So it might be go and have tapas and cocktails on a Friday night. That sounds a lot more fun than folding chairs. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And it'll be a little bit of, you know, there might be a speaker who comes in and gives you some resources and whatever to begin with, but they're not, it's not going to be super formal. It's going to be informal, just like a friend would. Yeah. Is that going to be statewide or is it going to be more so? We're going to try to pilot it here and out in in Huntsville, North Alabama, and see how it goes and then possibly expand. But Huntsville will be our pilot city. That would be really cool, and you can yeah. just have uh, kind of the leaders of the crew in each in each area that they, you know, mm-hmm. are at. Yeah. And you beat me, too. Where is the easiest place for people to interact with you online? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we're all, uh, we do, we have a website. Like I said, we're getting a new one, so it'll be a little bit easier to, to access our information there. Uh, but, yeah, Facebook uh, seems to be the most popular. We are on Twitter, but uh, most people do uh, – interact with us a lot on Facebook and that's where they go to see where our trainings and everything are. But always call us, give us a call or email us and uh, we filled a lot of phone calls and uh, we're always happy to talk to you. I like your website. I know it's getting an upgrade, <laughs> but I think it's a very visually pleasing <laughs> website. Oh, good. Thank you. Yeah. I appreciate that. So. It's just some of the information we need to change over as our grants change, our services change. So we got to get that updated. Well, that's a good thing because you're always constantly serving the community and in order to do that, it means change. Yeah, that's right. So that's a, a really good thing. Um, is there anything that we haven't talked about that you would like to uh, say? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay. Pretty tough. Um, so November is um, Caregiver Appreciation Month. And so every November what we do is um, an event for these caregivers to show that we appreciate what they're doing. Um, so, you know, in the past years, we've done um, just an event where they come in, we feed them, we play games, they've got somebody coming out to do manicures or massages. Um, this year is going to look a little different. Um, we're looking at November 15th, but we're actually going to do one of those um, caregiver night out is what we're going to go with. Um, so it's going to be very limited this year. Um, especially since it's the first one, but we're looking at doing um, a paint night or a, uh, we're looking at hammer and stain right now to do an activity with them so the caregivers can meet there, we'll feed them, they can drink if they want to drink. (laughs) Um, They'll have that support around them. So um, we're looking at November 15th for that. There will be a flyer. And like I said, it's going to be limited. Um, We're probably going to do about 25 people this year. Um, So it's going to be first come, first serve. So stay tuned for the flyer is it open right now is registration it's not open right now we're still nailing out details but it will be soon gotcha so keep an eye out for that go to uh so how would that information be should someone sign up for the email list Uh, so it'll probably be on our facebook we'll put it on facebook when we've got that flyer created um emailing to rsvp is probably the best um we might have a lot because I feel like it's going to be a pretty hot commodity. Yeah. <laughs> so they might want to call um, just to get their name on the list. But we will. We'll circulate that through constant contact with all of our partners um, up here because that's going to the first one will be North Alabama. Yeah. Um, typically we do events in Birmingham, um, but if anybody else is interested in partnering in a different part of the state, we're always welcome to that. Yeah. Uh, I like the idea of piloting it here and then, um, you know, kind of breaking out from there on those appreciation get togethers and what have you. Yeah. Uh, so that's awesome. One thing I did fail to mention was our application is available in Spanish. <laughs> <laughs> we, we talked about it earlier and I forgot to mention it again. I got here. We were, yeah. we were going over the talking points and Mrs. Senowitz uh, had Spanish next to it. I'm like, I can't, you don't want me to talk about that in Spanish? I cannot talk. <laughs> Uh, well, I'd like to thank you for being yeah, here with us thank today. Thank you. Appreciate, appreciate your time. Yeah. Um, and guys, get on this stuff. So uh, make sure you get on the list for the community outing and um, for the respite that's available right now. And at this time, we'll go ahead and end this stream. And we will see you guys at 1 o'clock this afternoon.